Well, good morning, y'all. If you have your Bible, let's go to John chapter 11. You'll find John right after Matthew, Mark, and Luke. If you don't have a Bible, there's a big Bible on the screen. How about that? Are you glad you came to church? It looks a little different in here today than it normally does. What the problem is. <laughs> no. No, I'm just kidding. I'm glad you're here. Thank you for coming, man. This is awesome. There ain't nothing fancy about us. We just love Jesus. We're sinners saved by grace. We like, we like making a big deal of Jesus. That's why we're here. Every single one of us have a, a past, but it's been wiped away by grace and mercy. So thank you for coming. So we're going to look at... Uh, a little bit about Lazarus today in John chapter 11 because we want to know a little more about resurrection. Resurrection, what we celebrate today, Jesus got up. Can you imagine those ladies when they went to the tomb and said, wait a minute, the stone's gone? Jesus is, where Jesus? They were sad, but now they're not sad because Jesus was gone. Why was Jesus gone? Jesus wasn't gone. Jesus was alive. Jesus is alive. The tomb is empty. Amen? That, that, is, that is huge to us. And we'll see a little, little more about that as we get into it. So let's take that word resurrection. So I looked it up in the Greek language. Greek is what the New Testament was written in. And basically it means resurrection means that dead things come alive. When have you known something dead to come alive? If it wasn't associated with Jesus, <laughs> Right? So what dead coming to life means that hope, listen to me, hope is alive. Hope is alive. There's a reason that hope is alive, and the only reason that hope is alive is because Jesus is alive. So you may have come in this morning feeling hopeless, and I have good news for you today. Your feelings are lying to you. Your emotions are lying to you. Listen, I've learned in my life that I don't need to be living by my feelings or my emotions. I live by the truth of God's word. So I say if you feel hopeless today, your feelings are lying to you because the truth says Jesus is alive. He got up. Therefore, hope is alive. I love that old song. One of y'all said it in the, in the group text this morning. It says, hope is alive. We have hope. Because Jesus is alive, we can face what? Tomorrow and today. I need him today too. Amen. So let's jump into this thing. Now, here's what I do before I read any scripture or get into the word. I ask the Lord to speak to me. So do the same. Say, Lord, he will. He will. He'll speak to you. You'll, you'll, un, you'll catch an understanding that you haven't had before, and you're like, where'd that come from? That came from the Lord. So let's jump in. We're going to jump in kind of in the middle of this story in verse 30, do a little bit of reading, but I'm going to explain it to you as we go. Jesus, it says, now Jesus had not come into town, but he was in the place where Martha, Martha had ran out to meet him. And it says that there were Jews who were with her in the house, they were comforting her. And when they saw that Mary rose up and quickly went out, so the Jews followed her, saying, well, she must be going to the tomb because she's going to go cry where Lazarus is, is in the tomb. Right? So verse 32 says, Then when Mar Mary came where Jesus was, and she saw Jesus, she fell down at his feet. And watch what she says. She said, Lord, Lord. If you had had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. What you say? I guess he had to be living for Jesus to help him out. So we got three siblings here. We have Mary, we have Martha, and we have Lazarus. That's the brother. That's the one that's, that's dead, right? He got sick and he died. Okay? So Jesus heard about it. So he's coming to see them. Now, you got to understand about these three. This, this was his friends, okay? He loved them so much. He loved them very much. So he, he, he came to see what he could do. 
He came to help out, and he came to, to comfort and visit and, and be there for him, right? Isn't that what good friends do? Watch verse 33. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and saw the Jews who came, everybody's crying, everybody's weeping, he groaned in his spirit because he was troubled. And he said, hey, y'all, because he's from Texas, right? <laughs> Where have you laid him? And so everybody said, well, Lord, come and see. This is a real sweet time, right? Lord, come and see. In verse 35, the shortest verse in the, in the whole Bible says Jesus did what? He wept. We cannot pass over that right there. Because it's so cool when you see that Jesus himself, God himself is crying. Because you do realize he's still man. It, the, the scripture says he's fully man just as much as he was fully God. So don't ever think that he didn't hurt, that he didn't cry, that his belly didn't get tore up. Right? You probably ain't never heard that, but I'm just saying, he's a regular dude. You've been watching The Chosen, haven't you? <laughs> you see, you see, right? So, so you see his humanity right here. Why? He is hurting and he is weeping with the family. There's a verse in Psalm 138, verse 8, that says this, that, that, that God is concerned with what concerns you. I, did you hear that? Whatever you're concerned with today, he's concerned about it. And he says he will perfect that. In other words, he will work that thing out that's concerning you right now. That may shock you today. But that's what the word says. This is, we get a peek of it when Jesus is crying with the family. He's sad too. He's sad because they're sad. And listen, you got to know, we know the story, right? He's fit to tell Lazarus to get up. Okay. So he knows that what they're crying about can, is going to stop, okay? But while they're crying, he cries. Why? Because his friends are hurting. So let me tell you, if he cries for Mary and Martha, and he's worried about Jesus, he's, he's, he's sad about G, uh, Lazarus being dead, don't you know he's concerned about every little thing that you're thinking about right now? So don't think he's just way off and gone somewhere that you don't, oh, he don't care about me. That's a lie. That's a lie from the devil. So, yeah, we see his humanity. He's crying. He's weeping with the family. But here's the cool thing. We see his deity or his God side because he's able to reverse the thing that's making the folks cry. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> so you see both sides of Jesus right here. Let's keep, keep reading. Verse 36. Y'all still with me? Jew says, oh, Jesus is crying. See how much, see how he loves them. See how he loved Lazarus. Some of them said, could he not have, uh, 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 he said, he opened the eyes of the blind. Could he not kept this man from dying? They're just talking, right? Jesus, again, groaning in himself, came to this tomb, and the tomb was in a cave, and there was a stone against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. And that's where you say, what you say? Somebody calling you on Easter. Say, hello. <laughs> Say, did you hide the eggs yet? <laughs> or do you got that chicken ready? Because I'll be there soon. Jesus is alive. Amen. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Just hit the button. Hit the button. Okay. It's, 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 it's your phone. It's your phone. <laughs> That's funny right there. I don't care who you are. So what does he say? You picture this. Jesus is walking up. And he says, y'all take away the stone. Wait a minute, Jesus. He's dead. <laughs> right? He said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of, of, of Lazarus who was dead, said, Lord, by this time, man, it's, it's, it's stinking in there. It's a stench. He's been dead for four days. The original King James Version, I love that. It says, he stinketh. <laughs> he stinketh. Right? So, ladies, you can tell your husband when he comes in work, you sticketh. Right? That's King James Version. <laughs> so, but he said, hey, did I not tell you that if you believe, you're going to see the glory of God? Now, I want you to think about this. This is a little bit deeper than what we've been talking about. Why would he tell them to take away the stone? Listen, there always has to be a sign of faith to move Jesus. Don't forget this. There's, th 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 we've got to really and really trust Jesus if you want to see him to move. If This is a good note. Faith will always precede seeing. 
Because honest, okay, if you see first, well, then it ain't faith. There's no faith there. So seeing comes after the faith. Have you ever read Hebrews 11.6 where it says it's impossible to please God without what? Without faith. It says that we must believe that he is who he says he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's good stuff. So when he says move away the stone, he just looks at them then. He says, I ain't moving it. Why? Because he wants to see faith. Yeah, she said, Lord, and she's thinking in the, in, in the normal, like I probably would have thought this too. Like, yeah, you don't want to open that? There's some flies in there. You know what I'm saying? Four days is a long time probably out in that desert. You know what I'm saying? But notice what he said to her again. He said in verse 40, he said, Did I tell you that, if, if you, that you would see? You would see the glory of God if you believe. If you show me some faith, you would see what's about to go down. And you think, well, when did he say that? Well, we didn't read that. It was over in verse 21. Let's just pick it up. Now, this is prior to what we read before, obviously. Look at verse 21, chapter 11. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, this is the other sister. My brother wouldn't have died. But then she throws through this in. She said, I know whatever you ask God, God's going to give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will get up. He will rise again. Martha said, oh, I know, I know. He'll get up on the last day, on the resurrection. See, she knew the truth. She, knew, she said when Jesus comes back, everybody's going to get up. Right? So she knew that. But he said, no, girl, that's not what I'm talking about. Look at verse 25. He says, hey, listen to me. I am. I am. I am. Me. I am the resurrection and the life. What you say. Amen? Okay. He's trying to tell her who he is. He said, listen to me. If you believe... Though you die, you won't die. You're going to live. And, and, and whoever lives in me, verse 26, shall never die. And he says, do you believe this? Church, that's powerful when he says, I am. I am. I'm telling you, he says, I am. He's, okay, when you, when you see the word I am, here, here's, a, here's a little school for you. That's present tense. Okay? And what did she do? She said, oh, I know, I know in the resurrection, you know, he, he, he's going to rise. No, he said, girl, I see, he said, I, I am. I am, meaning I am, I am present right now. He's in other, in other words, I got you, girl. I got you right now. So you do realize, I don't know if you've ever done a study of God's names. Man, he's got some awesome names. I mean, Yahweh, Jehovah. I mean, Yahweh, when we breathe, it sounds like Yahweh. Have you ever thought about that? I read that somewhere. It's like, when you breathe, it sounds like Yahweh. <sighs> Yahweh, right? I mean, just our very breath, we're speaking God's name. That's powerful. Okay? But one of my favorite names, you know, Jehovah, Jehovah, I mean, he's a personal God. He's your God. He's my God, right? But one of my favorite names is I Am. Moses asked God, he says, like, when I go to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let my people go, who, who do I tell him sent me? He goes, I am. <laughs> I, why? Because I am is present, right? That's my favorite. Okay, because whatever we need, church, listen to me, this is relevant right now today as we're in this room. Whatever you need right now, he says, I am. Right now. Not, not, not later. He says, I am right now. Okay, he, say, he says, okay, do you need a healer? I am. Okay, are you going through some stuff right now and you need a comforter? I am. Okay, not tomorrow. I am right now. You need some help? You remember he says, I'm your ever-present help in time of need. I need help right now, Jesus. He says what? I am. You need some strength? You're like, Lord, you, be you better do something because I can't handle this anymore. What does he say? I am. He said, you do what you can do, and I got you. These, there's always got to be some, but we always got to put some effort forth, and he will, he will, he, I am shows up. Listen, if you're in here today, you need peace. That's, he's the prince of peace. If you need joy, he says, I am joy. If you need forgiveness, if you need mercy, if you need grace, if you need hope, he says, I am am that so notice she said my brother's dead so they're needing a resurrection they're needing some hope 
And that's when he says, hey, I am the resurrection. I, I give you hope. I raise dead to life. I am the life. I'm what you need. I love there's a verse. There's a verse in Acts, Acts 17, 28. I read this a long time ago, and I've never forgotten it. But he literally says, he says, he says that in him, in Jesus, listen to this, we live, we move, we have our very being. Do you believe that today? Listen to that. In him, in Jesus, the, the, in other words, we, outside of him, this is not true. In him, we live, we have life, we move, right? We have our very, we're alive because of Jesus, and then it goes off to say, like, the poets call us his offspring, his children. In other words, we're a child of God. Do you believe that? Listen, God created you. He's your father whether you acknowledge it or not. A lot of us got some daddies we don't acknowledge. And God's the same way to some folks. We're, we don't acknowledge him. He's still your daddy. So believe it or not, we all brothers and sisters, whether you believe it or not, but it's so amazing when you do give your life to him and you truly call him father and you have a relationship. There's nothing more beautiful than an awesome relationship with your parents. When you have an awesome relationship with your parents, well, your daddy God is no different. He wants a relationship with you. He don't want to just save you and say, all right, bye, have a good life. No, that's the start of a relationship. Work on that thing, man. Amen. Okay, let's, let's see what happens. Jump to, back to verse 41. Y'all still with me? You good? So they took away the stone. Good job. What does that show? Faith. Good job, y'all. Took away the stone where the dead man was laying. Jesus lifted up his eyes. He starts praying, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I know you always hear me. But because of these folks are standing here listening, he says, I want you to do something so they may know that you sent me. When he'd said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Come on, somebody. Lazarus, come. Now, again, I've said this, and you've probably heard this a million times, but why did, they call, why did he call him by name? Because everybody would have got up. If he would have said, hey, y'all, come forth. We would have come forth. We ain't even born yet. <laughs> Shoom. Hey, Lord, <laughs> where, where you come from? <laughs> well, I ain't made you yet. You go back. <laughs> Lazarus, <laughs> come forth. And then, then we, you know, you always talk about Lazarus been dead four days. He's already with God. And he's like, no, <laughs> I like it up here. He's fishing. <laughs> hey, he's eating the best chicken ever. He's like, he's, like, he, he's glorifying God. And he's like, no. <laughs> I don't want to go back, but he's got to go back, come back, right? Because the one who created him says, uh, hey, I need you. Come on back. He who died came out, now watch this, bound, hand and foot, with grave clothes. His face was wrapped with a cloth, and Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Okay. What does all this mean to us today in Gladewater, Texas over here? Here's one thing. You may be in here today and you, 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 you have something similar in common with Mary and Martha. And that is that there's something either dead in your life right now or it's dying. So you can kind of feel their pain. Something may have already died in your life or something is, is, is dying right now. They, listen, this could be anything from a relationship, a marriage, a relationship maybe with a child, one of your children. You're not as close to one of your children anymore. Maybe that relationship you feel like it's dying. You don't know what to do. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's not even a relationship at all. Maybe it's something like a passion that you used to have. You used to have this fire in you, and it's, it's, it's no longer there because of circumstances in your life. Maybe it's a dream. Maybe it's a calling in your life. Maybe it's just hope in general. You have, your hope is that you're just going day by day by day, and it's just, you just feel like you're existing. We just sang a song that says that you were made for way more than that. 
You're made by God who custom made you. He says he knew you before you were in your mother's womb. That means you're a dream come true, right? Before, right? And then he says you're fearfully and wonderfully made. That means he took his time on you. He put stuff in you that nobody else has. Your DNA matches no one else. You're one of a kind. You're a custom-made individual. You're not a mistake. Okay? So, so what is that for you right now? That just in general should give you hope. He, 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 he wants to use you, whether it's right there in your home, whether it's where you work. Cody just nailed it earlier. She said, he, God wants to use you. Will you let him use you? Listen, there's still hope. We started this message by saying that hope is alive now. Listen, we just saw that, that Lazarus was laid in a tomb. And there was stuff, there was a stone even covering that tomb. You couldn't even get in there. And maybe that's how you feel. There is a stone hiding what used to be you. And what used to be a relationship. What used to be a dream. What used to be a call. And what used to be all of this and all of that. And you feel like it's gone and it's dead. Please hear me. We just read it. Jesus takes things that are dead... And brings them back to life. Do you believe it? But what does he need on our part? He needs faith. He needs us to move the stone. Right? So I'm asking you today, what's your stone? What, what, it, what is that stone that is hiding what, what, what you have buried And it's going to be different for all of us. But what I'm telling you today is there's hope. And he says, if you'll move the stone, he says, I'll bring that thing back to life. But to move the stone, he needs your faith. He needs your trust. He needs your obedience. Because why would he do it if you didn't care? There's another thing I see in this story that I want you to see. If you're in here today and you truly know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, think about Lazarus spiritually. It's a picture of our salvation, really. Lazarus is, if you think about it. When we put our faith and we put our trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior, He then becomes I am to us. He's the resurrection and the life to us. What does that mean? When you say, Lord, I can't do this anymore. I've tried this way, that way, their way, www dots way, and it's not working. Would you do like Carrie Underwood said, and Jesus, take this wheel? Okay? And when he says, yes, I will, he says, I'm the I am. I'm the resurrection and the life. So he's going to take a dead man walking and raise it to life. Amen? Has he done that to you in your life? Let me give you some scriptures so you don't think I'm lying. Ephesians 2, verse 1. Notice what it says. It says, He, Jesus, made alive those who were what? Dead in our trespass and our sins. What does that mean? We were dead. We, were, we thought we was living. Hey, we up on the speaker box in the club. Some of you know what I'm talking about, right? Give me another, wherever you were, <laughs> whatever you thought you were doing. Maybe you was taking stuff and making money. And you're like, man, I'm living now. But, but, you know, whatever you were doing, what was that? It was sin. It was sin. It wasn't honoring God. Whatever that was for you. I'm not going to go into my list here, okay? <laughs> I don't know what it was, okay? Listen. What did he say? He said, you once were this way, but now I made you what? Alive. What does that make you? It makes you resurrected spiritually. Can I give you another verse? 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Jesus Christ, he is a what? A new creation. The old has passed. Behold, all things have become new. Come on, somebody. 
So if you're a female in here and you feel like, you know, you lived your life a certain way and you've just given yourself away all these many times and you've lived like a lot of us have lived and you just feel like you've been used up and you're worthless. God says, I make all things new, fresh, clean, white. It's all brand new. Come on, somebody. That's what Jesus does. Don't you think he's worthy of praise? I'm not being quiet anymore. You, you hear me? Here's another. Look at verse 44 again. He who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was even wrapped with a cloth. Go here with me on this. Why didn't they wrap up a dead man? They scared he's going to get loose. You know? I mean, <laughs> no, it's just what they do, right? So Lazarus comes alive. Put yourself in Lazarus' shoes. Zoom. He's alive. <laughs> right? He like, oh, man. <laughs> what is that? Sorry. You know, whatever. <laughs> right? Okay. But wait a minute. He's alive, right? Don't miss this. He's alive. But what is he wrapped with? He wrapped with the stuff he needed when he was dead. Let it soak in. I wonder who in here is alive. You've given your life to Jesus. But there's so much remnant of your old life in them grave clothes of our past. You hear me? That you're still wrapped in. I mean, if we could see in the spirit world, I wonder how many of us would have come in looking like a mummy. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I'm being serious. Go with me on it. Right? You come in. You seen old movies. <laughs> the mummy. <laughs> right? What is he's all wrapped up? Okay. Or, wait a minute. Or some, some of us is free, and you got this, but there's something else is wrapped. You know, you're like, you, you, have for, you have free, but, you know, you're coming in like that. I'm serious. I wonder how many of us still carry around our grave clothes from our old life. Listen, we've Jesus come, Jesus take it all, Jesus take, but he, but he, and he tries, but we don't let him. So what am I talking about? Okay, what about that bad habit? That's grave clothes. What about that addiction? You just can't give it, you can't get out of it. You can't, you keep trying. Thank you, Lord, for setting me free, and then you go right back to it. That's grave clothes. That's like Cody and them was singing. You're, we are tending a grave when we do that. We're tending. We, uh, how silly it is. We've been set free, and we go back to where we were dead, and we just keep, keep making sure. Put, I'm going to put some flowers out right here. And, and this, is, this is Quit tending that grave. Jesus has set you free. What is it? Bad habits? Is it addiction? Is it your old mindset still hanging around? Well, we've always done it this way. But Jesus said, let it go. Maybe you're, we talked about it Wednesday night. Are you still just so defensive that it's hard to have a relationship with somebody? Are you so mad? Are you still angry? What are you mad about? Oh, no. Just mad. That's grave clothes. Is this making sense to anybody? Anybody got unforgiveness hanging on them? You got that pride still hanging on you? Listen to me. I, listen to me. I don't want to be set free still looking like a mummy. Hey, that's a shirt. I don't want to be, we ought to do it, put a mummy and then, I don't want to be set free and still looking like a mummy. What do you think? Y'all crazy. There you go. Y'all crazy. Somebody make some shirts, man. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Do you agree with that? Okay. Why we still got grave clothes on? Matthew 11, verse 28 says this. Jesus says, come to me. It's a great, one of the greatest verses you ever hear. Hey, Jesus said, hey, y'all, come to me if you're heavy. Come to me if you need rest. Come to me if you're hurting, you're crying, you're tore up. He, says, he said, come to me. Come to, where? Come to me. Quit going everywhere else. Come to me. If you've fallen, if you've messed up, you were following Jesus, but you're no longer following Jesus. You messed up. He says, that's heaviness. Come to me. I don't know how much more clear he can make it. Here's what he's saying. If you still have grave clothes on, come to me. 
Okay, let's put it in perspective. As a parent, if one of your children were, was hurting, maybe if your, children, your child messed up, now I'm talking about any age here, if your ch- child has fallen or fallen out or fallen away, whatever, who do you want them to come to? You? You? Right? No, I'm serious. Like, like as a parent, want, I, want, I want my child to come to me. Obviously, we can be spiritual and say, I want you to come to Jesus. No, listen, we, we're going to take them to Jesus, okay? But what I'm getting at, I'm, saying, I'm trying to show you the heart of a parent. We want our child, when they're hurting or if they fall, we want them to come to us because we're going to fix them up, right? Is Jesus any different? You see what I'm saying? Well, if they've messed up, if your child has done the most horrible thing and they've messed up, listen, come on, it's okay, we'll work it out, right? Jesus is saying that to you today. He's like, hey, you've fallen, you've messed up, you've, 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 you've done something you didn't think you would ever do. Come to me. I got you. I love you. I created you. I put breath in your lungs. I'm your daddy. I'm your savior. I'm your Lord, right? Right? Jesus is no different. Let's go to Hebrews 12, and I'm going to start to wrap up here before we take the Lord's Supper. Uh, Hebrews, that's right before James. Or you can look at the screen. I encourage flipping in your Bible because it'll teach you where the books are. Your brain, God made your brain to remember things until you get over 50. What did you say your name was? What's your name? <laughs> That's funny. Y'all was here last week. Brother Gene, bless his heart. I'm telling you, I can, I can, I'll forget anything. Okay. I want to set this up. Hebrews 12 out of Revelation 22, 13. Let's look at it on screen. He says... I'm the Alpha. This is Jesus speaking. He says, I'm the Alpha. I'm the Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. I'm the first and the last. Okay. Alpha, first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Omega, last letter of the Greek alphabet. Did I say Hebrew? Greek. Greek. Alpha, Omega, Greek. Y'all leaving? Where y'all going? I'm just kidding. (laughs) Don't you hate that when that happens? (laughs) She's like, I don't want to hear about the Alpha and Omega. Alpha. And Omega, right? First and last, right? Jesus says, I'm the first and the last. Okay? All right, think about it. Our alphabet got 26 letters, right? Alphabet, that's actually the first two in the Greek. Alphabet, right? Anyway. So, 26 letters. Follow me in this. Those 26 letters make up... Anybody play Scrabble? (laughs) Nobody plays Scrabble. (laughs) I figured somebody would tell me, yeah, that's me, that's me. Nobody plays great. Yeah. I want you to think, either in the south, in the north, wherever you live and wherever people live, there's 26 letters of the English language that make up how many words? Honestly, I tried to look it up and find out. It, like said, infinity. Because you know, if you ever look in the redneck uh, book, I mean, hey, y'all, you know gone to you know it's just i mean it's just you know what it is you know how it is right so okay think about that all the, all these words that our alphabet make up in a similar way stay with me with this just 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 as our 26 letters is sufficient for all communication right it's sufficient okay jesus is sufficient for all of life and anything we can make up or come up with, he's sufficient for. Do you believe that? He is. Because Jesus says, I'm the Alpha, the Omega, but what he's really saying, I'm the first and the last, that means if he's the first and the last, he doesn't skip what's in between. He's everything. He's everything to us. Colossians 3.11 says, Christ is all and in all. All. What does all mean? All. Isn't there some Washington detergent called all? Does it really get out all? No, but Jesus does. <laughs> Amen. So alpha means first. Okay, what does first mean? First means he's actually first. He's first in rank whether we put him there or not. But here's the thing. He's such a gentleman. He wants to be first in your life. 
So is he first in your life? See, I've learned in my life, and I screw up so much, it's like I, I keep putting myself first. I got to get myself down. He's got to be first. That's what I'm learning in my life. And then he says he's Omega. Omega. What does that mean? He's the finisher. Don't you think he, reserve, he needs dibs in our life? Do y'all still say dibs, young folk? He needs dibs. He needs, he need, don't you think he's already put in enough work that he ought to get first shot? Philippians 1.6 says this. That he started a good work. And he will complete it. You hear that? When you come to him and you cry out to him, he starts a work in your life. He's Omega. But he says he's not going to start something and not finish it. He's not going to alpha you and not Omega you. He's a good God like that. Hebrews 12, 2. Did you go there? Therefore... Now, if you read Hebrews 11, it's talking about faith, and it's talking about all these wonderful people of faith that's went on before us. So notice it starts out this, this by saying that we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. If you, if you say that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, I'm telling you, you got people watching you at work, at church, I mean, your family, your, your babies, everybody's watching you. And, and, and even, he even brings up the, the, how cool it is, like, like, how cool would it be if, you, if your grandma that had passed is watching you? Some of your family, they're rooting for you. Let's go. They can do this. Let's go. You can do I taught you better than that. <laughs> right? <laughs> and Jesus is saying, no, you don't want to see this. <laughs> right? So it says we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Parents, do you believe your children are watching you? Grandchildren, grandparents, do you think your children, grandchildren are watching you? Yeah, they are. Okay, so here's the deal. It tells us to lay aside every weight, grave clothes, hello, anger, bad habits, addictions, unforgiveness, being mean. Let's lay aside every weight that so easily gets us and ensnares us and ties us down. It says, what did it say do to it? Man, we got to put this stuff aside. I don't want my children struggling with what I struggle with. I don't want my friends struggling what I struggle with. I want to be there to point them to Jesus and not, not me. So we need to lay that stuff aside. And we need to run the race to the Lord with the Lord. Right? Run, what does it say? Endurance. It's already set before us. What's set before us? The cross of Jesus Christ is set before us. Look at verse 2. Here's what we should do. We should look to the author and the finisher of our faith. Come on, somebody. Who is that? The Alpha, the Omega. In the Hebrew, it's the Aleph and the Tav. That's who we should look to. Listen, what does it say? It says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Church, this is who we need to be fixated on. We are fixated on so much stuff right now. We're looking at our peripherals. We're trying to drive looking at our phone. Man, I don't know who y'all are in the left lane. But we're looking at your phone, but quit that mess. Can I get an amen? amen? Did you hear that? Quit driving in the left lane looking at your phone. You go, that's, that makes it hard to live for Jesus. I want people... <laughs> In my life to make living for Jesus easier. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you learn a lot of stuff in here. So listen, fixate, looking to Jesus. He's the author, the finisher, right? We should be fixated on him. Not it didn't say, hey, sneak peek Jesus when you get a chance. Right? It didn't say that. I saw him. Jesus, I saw him. I saw Jesus. No, he says fix, fix. What does fix mean? Like that camera, that, that Facebook live thing right there, you know, is looking, is, 
is fixed. Why? Right here, because I'm the one talking right now. Okay? It's, it's fixed. We need to be fixed. Like, go ahead and crank down the screws. Fixed on Jesus. Because when all this other stuff's going on, eh, I'm, I'm, I'm fixed on Jesus. Oh, that's way better than a sneak peek. You, you, okay, you tell me. Has anybody ever went to like a sneak peek? Like, oh, here we go. I was at the movie. King Kong. King, uh, what is it? Yeah. Godzilla King Kong right now. Let me tell you something. There's some other movies coming out. One, remember Twister? There's a Twisters coming out. And let me tell you, was that the IMAX? I mean, I was in the thing. I was in. But then it goes off. I'm like, man, I wanted to watch that. Now, King Kong and Godzilla was really good. I ain't going to lie. Go see it. But, but, but Twister, all I got was a sneak peek. I didn't want a sneak peek. I'm remembering Bill Paxton and, and Helen Hunt. And they're like, right, like, I wonder if that's them, their kids. Like, I got all these questions now. <laughs> but do you see what I'm saying? There's a difference between sneak peeking a movie and watching the movie. Jesus wants us to be fixed on him. Last thing, I'm done, I promise. Matthew 40, let me show you this and we're done. I got to show you this. I can't go somewhere. and then See, this is a high-risk area. I should have told you all before you came in. This is Matthew 14, and then we're going to take uh, the Lord's Supper. Matthew 14, look at verse. Y'all know the story, real quick. Verse 25. Disciples are in the boat, right? This is the fourth watch. Tell you what time it is. Jesus came walking to the disciples on the water. Remember this? And the disciples saw that Jesus was walking on the water, and they said, look, they don't know it's Jesus. It's a ghost. Because there was a lot of old tales where that ghost was out there walking on the water. They, saw, they thought Jesus was a ghost. So they cried out in fear. But immediately in verse 27, Jesus says, hey, y'all, it's me. No, what did he say? Be of good cheer. It is I. Don't be afraid. He's walking on the water, y'all. Jesus walking on water. Have you ever walked on water? Maybe if you was in a boat and had to pee real bad, you run. A, you need to get off. Anyway, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Jesus is walking on the water. <laughs> Jesus is walking on the thing that we're scared of. Okay. So Peter comes out, and he says, Lord, if that's really you, I want to walk on the water too. All right, all right, let's do it. He says, come. So Peter got out of the boat. He walked on the water to Jesus. Okay, but then it says when he saw the wind, he starts to sink. Now, after what we just talked about, sneak peek versus fixed on Jesus, you tell me right now, when he said he saw the wind, he must have took his eyes off of Jesus. How does this work in our life? Okay? We are looking at Jesus. We're fixed on Jesus, but something pops up. Ah! That scared you, didn't it? Ah! What is this? And you look at it. We start to sink. Got these problems. Tell them. Tell them. Don't tell them. Ah! Look. What did I say? What did we say? What did the Bible say? Uh-uh. He will let us know. He will let us know what we need to do. Not the, whatever that is for you. Look at what he said. When he saw the wind, it was big. It was scary. He began to sink. He said, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand. He caught him. He said, oh, buddy, you a little faith. That's us. Lord, what am I going to do? Look at me. What am I going to get, Lord? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look at me. Y'all crazy. <laughs> Why are we sinking? Taking our eyes off Jesus. I'm going to ask the worship team to come. And I'm going to ask my guys to get ready for uh, to pass out the Lord's Supper. You can go on and get, get in place and get ready and... I'm going to ask uh, Miss Tina if she'll ease them lights back down. (laughs) 
And guys, what we're about to do is one of the most important things we could ever do. This ain't a taste test. This is not anything for nutrition. This is a time to simply reflect on Jesus, which is the most heaviest thing you can do. You agree with that? So when Hebrews 12 verse 2 said that we, that Jesus says that he, it said for the joy that was set before him, listen to that, the joy set before him endured the cross. I don't know about you, I don't see any joy in a whipping post and being nailed to a tree. But he wasn't talking about that. He was talking about what the whipping post and him dying meant. It meant that he could be with me and you forever. Do you understand that? It meant that, that if he died for us, if he took our sin and paid our sin, which we couldn't pay, if he did that, he would make a way that me and you could be with him forever. I mean, he didn't even mention. He didn't. Even, and if you'll notice, like anything said about the crucifixion, anything said about the whipping post, somebody else writes it. Jesus was silent about it. Why? Because he was fixed on doing what he came to do out of love and passion for us. Can you imagine that? He never said, "Well, look what I did for you." He never said that. He just did it, and he made the way. So we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus today. But I want you to make sure you understand that, that what we call Good Friday wasn't good for Jesus physically. It was the best thing for us. Yeah, Friday's good because Sunday's coming. But for Jesus physically, said so that the cross is where righteousness and peace kiss. It's where joy and the greatest joy and the greatest sorrow, they kiss at the cross. You know how hard it was on him as a man because he was in the garden and he was praying. And he said, Father, if there's any other way, is there any other way? I don't really want to do this. Three times. And the Father never said. So Jesus knew, I got to do this. So he fixed his eyes on what he had to do. Why? Because it was, he loved, do you realize that? He loves you. He has a passion for you. You know, when, when you really like somebody and you, and you really love them and you're like, you're, you're, you, 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 you kind of smother them because you, con, you're concerned and you want to be a part of everything they do and everything they think about. You know, I used to ride, when I was riding in my truck with my dad and we're going hunting or fishing or whatever, he would look at me all the time. He'd say, what are you thinking about? Want me some chicken? That's what I'm thinking about. Hungry. You know, I mean, just, but he, but it wasn't, it wasn't, he didn't really, wasn't that. He was just like, hey, he just cured, he loved me. So he, what are you thinking about, son? I do that with my kids today. Cody does that with me. What are you thinking about? Like, why, they, why do people say that? Just because they love us. So I want to read something to you here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And it's talking about when we do what we're about to do. And I want you to hear this very quick, very, very carefully. He says, whoever eats this bread, what does the bread represent? His body. And drinks this cup. What is the, what is the cup? What is that juice? The blood. He said, whenever we do that, and, we, and he's calling it the bread and the cup of the Lord, but we do it in what? An unworthy manner? We're guilty of the body and the blood. Don't you listen to that? Now, again, Paul is talking to, talking to a Corinthian crowd here that they didn't care nothing about it. They'd come in drunk and, and everything else, and they were literally just doing it 
just to be doing it. Church, let me tell you something. I don't, we don't do it. We don't want to do it like that. Okay? He goes on to say, he's like, let a man examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks the cup. Notice what he said. For he who drinks in an unworthy manner, eats in an own, you're bringing judgment upon yourself. So what, what is that talking about? Is it, listen, we need to look at our life right now. If we truly, if, if Jesus, we truly mean that Jesus, you're my Lord and Savior. But we got all this mess. Now it's time to come to him with a mess. I'm going to ask you, and are you, aren't you sick of it anyway? Now's a great time. Listen, tomorrow's April 1st. It's lying day. <laughs> you can lie to somebody. No. April Fool's. But you can swap that fool around to a new day. You can walk out of here today. Grave clothes off of you. Free. Why? Because you're going to give them to Jesus. And then you're going to take this Lord's Supper and you're going to drink that cup and you're going to drink that, eat that bread and you're going to truly mean it this time. And you're going to walk out of here with a new vision, a new strength, a new freedom that you hadn't had in a long time. Don't you want to be that? Listen, you can't. You can do that right now today. So when you, when, when, when you have this in your hand, and, we're, and they're going to sing a song while we're doing this, be thinking about, Lord, what in my life right now do I need to confess to you? What do I need to bring to you? Because I don't want to do this in an unworthy manner. Move that stone. So he can work. Forgive that person. Finally. That may be your stone right now. Forgiveness. Unforgiveness could be keeping that dead thing dead. Forgiveness will move that stone. So I'm going to ask my guys to come and get in place and start handing out the elements. Worship team's going to sing a song. And when you get it, just hang on to it. Begin to examine yourself. Ask the Lord to show you what he's going to show you. And then I'll come back up and we'll do all this together. Amen.
beautiful song. This little wafer represents the body of our Savior, of Jesus. You think about when you put this in your mouth, it's, you're going to crush it, going to chew it up, can't think of a better description than what Jesus went through than crushed and chewed up. I'm not making that up. Isaiah talks about it. How he was crushed for our sin, our transgressions. He was shredded at the whipping post before he even made it to the cross. He was hit with a cat of nine tails. That's leather straps on a handle with bone and rock and glass, anything they could find to stitch into that strap, and it would hit Jesus, and it would rip his skin off. He even said as he was hanging on the cross that he could count his bones. So the price that is paid for you and I today the highest price ever paid for anything. So 
if you're in here today and you're thinking so less of yourself that you have no value, no, you are expensive. Very valuable. Church, when I think about the crown of thorns and I, I think about, I tried to find some big railroad spikes to just bring in here to show you. Like, I can't believe that that three of those was nailed into his body. If you ever want to ask me I wonder why I do what I do, it's that right there, man. I can't get away from that. I can't get away from what Jesus did for me. And I don't need to get away from it. It's what drives me. It's what's taken a little shy Arkansas boy that would never speak to anybody, definitely hardly anybody in public, standing up in front of you today. I'm passionate about what I'm talking to you about because Jesus has changed my life. His love for me changed my life. So when you eat this, and whatever your story is, and how you see Jesus, think about his body being crushed and chewed up for you. And thank him for that. So Lord, we thank you for your body that you gave to us. In Jesus' name. says he took this cup and it represents the new covenant in the blood his blood it's a blood covenant y'all everything his body went through every drop of blood poured out that blood is like a wedding ring it's a symbol of who we belong to And it's that same blood that washes our sin away. You want to talk about all detergent? Christ is all and in all. And he wipes away. It says, can you imagine as much as we've done in our life that he makes us white as snow? He casts our sin as far as the east is from the west. He didn't say north and south because you can stop going north when you hit the pole, right? But you never stop going east once you head that way. And you never stop going west once you start heading that way. So he says, I've cast that sin because of my blood. Past, present, and future. And that's not a license to go out and keep doing what we're doing. No, that is a Savior who loves you that canceled your debt. So remember that when you drink this little grape juice. It represents his blood. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood. In Jesus' name. So he says this in the scripture. He says, this is the cup of my blood. And when you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. He said, as often as you do this, Do this until the Lord comes back. It says we proclaim his death until he comes. Do you believe that he's coming back, church? Let me read you something before we sing our last song. This is found in 1 Thessalonians 4. Hello. Maybe that says time up. good (laughs) we're good (laughs) that's why I said we real around here right (laughs) listen to this and tell me if this doesn't fire you up so it says for the Lord himself that's Jesus will descend from heaven with a shout 
with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then he who are alive and remain caught up will get caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air, and we shall be with the Lord always from that moment. Do you understand that? Like if we were to die today, your body goes back in the ground where it came from. Scripture says this. Your spirit goes back to the Lord who gave it to you. It's you. Your spirit is eternal. If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you will be with him for eternity. If we don't know him, that spirit's still going to be in hell. We don't want to hear that. But that's rejecting Jesus. That's the place. Your spirit's going to live somewhere. How about with Jesus? Our knee is going to bow to him. Our tongue is going to confess. And I'm doing it right now. I'm not waiting. I want to be with him. Look what he's done for us, y'all. So that's what happens. And when, when he comes back, believe it or not, whatever is left in the grave of your body will catch up to your spirit in the air. And he says we'll get a new body that never will hurt, never will need anything but Jesus from that point on. Now, if he comes back and we're still alive, guess what? We don't have to die. <laughs> it says we, we, the dead in Christ rise first, and then we're caught up together. Everybody party. But here's what I love about the resurrection. And let me remind you of this awesome truth. When Jesus got out of the grave, he removed the sting of death. You do realize that's all the devil had. He had to scare, he, his thing was death, death. You die, you die, and you're dead, right? Jesus says, no, I conquered death, hell, and the grave. And it says in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, oh, hell, where is, you, you have nothing anymore. The, the grave has been swallowed up. You think about it. If you took the stinger out of a bee, all he is doing is buzzing and making noise. Let me tell you something. Jesus removed the stinger from the devil. The temptation and the lies that you hear right now is nothing but a busy, buzzy bee. He's lying to you. Listen to Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Amen. And let's praise him. Listen, we're going to sing this song. If anybody needs any prayer, anything after this song, please come to me. We'll, we'll get somewhere and we'll talk. But enjoy this song. We're going to sing Empty Grave. Pete's going to throw it down. But he's doing it for the glory of God. Amen. Love y'all. the 